Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we begin the story of Pensacola and the railroad. And it's a long story, a story which has had many ups and downs, many, many wonderful events that have, uh, ex in, in terms of history, have ab absolutely been exciting for the people who lived here. And of course the railroad helped to build many of the fortunes which were enjoyed here, particularly late in the 19th century. Our story begins almost immediately after Florida became a part of the United States. By the time we, we reached the mid-1820s, the United States was an expanding country, and for, the, for that particular period, most of the people were concentrating on toll roads built by the United States government and also the building of canals. In 1817, the New Yorkers had built a long canal uh, across the state, the so-called Erie Canal, and uh, when the people uh, began to settle into Pensacola in uh, northwest Florida here, one of the first ideas they had was to build a canal connecting uh, certain segments of the journey between here and New Orleans. Uh, studies were made, the Corps of Engineers became involved, but nothing came of the project. It was was just too expensive. Uh, by the time we reached the late 1820s, the idea of railroading and the harnessing of steam for transportation had now come into being. Now, this did not begin as an American story. The development of the steam engine, of course, was a, a British innovation. Um, names like James Watt, a newcomer, uh, were the ones who, who took steam, harnessed it for various purposes, particularly for the uh, mining of coal at the beginning. But quickly the idea uh, became uh, apparent that you could harness steam in a different way, uh, create an engine which would uh, pull vehicles along a track. Now, of course, the first, the first railroads, both in England and in the United States, were, were not uh, operated by steam locomotives. They were literally cars pulled by horses. We had such a thing uh, on the, just to the east of us here, and of course they did that in England in the coal mines. But by the time uh, George Stevenson and his son Robert began developing the new locomotive in England, the idea quickly flashed across the, uh, the Atlantic, and people in the United States were excited about it. They began, the, the entrepreneurs in New Jersey and New York, and Maryland began to buy British-built locomotives, bring them across the ocean, and to create uh, the idea of, of short-term, short-distance, short-haul uh, uh, railroads in that area. The Camden and Amboy in New Jersey was the first one. The Baltimore and Ohio, about 13 miles long to begin with, was the second. Uh, a third one began in New York State. And we began to hear tales about such engines as the Tom Thumb, which were, was built by a man named Peter Cooper in uh, New York State. The Americans were suddenly seized with railroad fever. Here in Pensacola, the idea was the same. People thought, well, we're, we, we looked at our, our geography, and here in, in Pensacola, we were, we were an island. Uh, we basically, there were no roads to speak of, and consequently, the only way to pass out of Pensacola one way or the other was by ship, but the railroad seemed to be the desirable idea. Well, now, to, to build a railroad, of course, takes money, and the, uh, the creation of a funding mechanism here in Pensacola began even before folks here began to think about railroads. We have to go back and recognize that people tried from the, the from almost from the day we became part of the United States, people here tried to create a bank, a bank which would be a, a, the usual functions of a bank, but also which might create currency. Well, they tried in the uh, in, in the beginning in 1821. That failed. It went through the whole decade. It was 1831 before the Bank of Pensacola finally was founded as a territorial bank. Now, the bank, by that time, of course, rail, the idea of railroading was, was uh, being uh, uh, passed back and forth across the area, and the, uh, a number of gro uh, local people did succeed in getting a, a legislative act passed, creating the Bank of Pensacola. And the bank opened downtown, and by the time we reach 1834, the bank had gone through all the mechanism of shareholding and so forth for itself, and then in that year, they sold $501,000 bonds which were to build, help to build the Alabama, Florida, and Georgia Railroad. Now, this was to be a railroad beginning on the docks in Pensacola, going north and east, and terminating at Columbus, Georgia. Of course, the, the long-term plan was that the, at that point it would connect to other roads being built uh, further on to the northeast. Well, uh, construction began. People brought the, uh, the money, uh, people brought the, the tools of, and supplies in. They employed a group of Irishmen. They brought them into Pensacola, and they, these were the men who were to hack a, a trail through going to the north and east. Uh, the first uh, iron rails arrived and were placed here on the docks ready for use, and the first rolling stock. 
But then, tragically, in about the middle of the year 1837, the financial panic struck the United States. The banks literally, literally, uh, literally went, went bankrupt. Our own bank in Pensacola managed to survive another three or four years, but it too uh, went bankrupt. They, it, was, it was impossible to pay the interest and the equity on the, on the bonds. The bondholders, who were uh, basically people from, uh, from Holland and uh, London, uh, uh, lost their money. Uh, they, it was a, just a, a very unfortunate affair, but uh, our dream of a railroad ended uh, by the, the end of 1837-38. And nothing happened further for us until we get into the, the period of just before uh, the war between the states. Now, before we t talk about that, we need to talk a little bit about what railroading was back then. Now, the, the, the early railroad engines that were built, the locomotives that were built, first of all, they, they, the initial uh, program, the initial plan, was to have a, a vertical boiler uh, with an engine that was then uh, uh, geared to the tr directly to the drive wheels, and these looked like little little boxes with a with a with a kind of a smokestack on them. Uh, that that didn't last long, but pretty soon they began to turn the thing around. And this is a tip. This is fairly typical of what a, an engine might have looked like by the eight, late 1830s and 40s. It had a horizontal boiler. Uh, the firebox was right in the in the rear here, and it carried a tender uh, behind it. We can. The, the tender behind it usually at this point in time carried wood, not coal, because the the engine mostly for that at that period found that uh, it was easier to transport wood uh, to uh, pick up points than it was coal. So basically, the engines began, and. In the beginning, the, the cars that were used were, were almost like the, the wagons that had been in use uh, for transporting goods and materials, and the coaches that were built were, uh, the first ones actually in, 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 uh, in use here, were nothing more than stagecoaches with a different kind of wheel. Now, about this same time, we, the, uh, the people, again, we must credit our friends in Great Britain for this, a man by the name of George Stevens uh, created what became known as the T-flanged rail. It was made of iron, not steel. The T-flanged rail made it easier and safer to have a specially designed wheel that would stay on the track. And so, bit, one by one, item by item, these, these uh, innovations came, and we began to, to put things to better, uh, in, in place that were much more practical. When the first American cars were built, they, they looked, um, again, they looked something like this. They were, they were long and narrow, and the, uh, they uh, had a straight aisle down the middle, and the coaches themselves, of course, were made of wood with the, uh, with the uh, iron wheels as, uh, as their transport. And as all of this proceeded, uh, the American system was quite different from that in Great Britain. Now, about, one thing we, we need to remember is that the, the, the distance between the rails, if we have rail A and rail B here, was four feet, eight inches. And people have often said, why in the world do we have a, a, that particular rather unusual distance? Well, again, that was a, a British development and the Americans simply copied it. And the British say, and I, I won't guarantee that this is exactly true, but the British say that the men who laid down the first rail were doing so because they were copying the track, the distance that was put in place for Roman chariots. The, the wheels in a, in a Roman chariot were bent this way, and they were four feet eight inches apart. And for some reason, the British copied that. The Americans copied it, and we're still using it on most of our rail lines today. There's a, another, a short, a narrower version, of course, what they call narrow gauge, but the, the four foot eight is, is still there. In, in, in Britain, of course, they did things different. We have our, from the beginning, our car was long, and it had a a a, 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 a no, down the center with seats on either side. In Britain, they, they had individual compartments where you could open the door to the outside to the platform and bring the people come inside. And then, of course, on the outside, there was also a, an aisle down the, uh, the outer side of the car. Now, the reason they did that was that the British and the French and the Germans were looking ahead, feeling, figuring that the, these rail cars might be used in time of war for carrying stretcher cases from the battlefield, from the, from the war zone, put them easily on a train. You couldn't do that easily if you brought them down a, a conventional aisle in a rail car. So that's the way the British and the French and the Germans began, and they're, they're still doing it today. They still operate with their rail cars designed that way. Uh, of course, the, in, in Britain, uh, they did things. If you take a look at this little coach here, this, this has four wheels on it. This is a, a standard rail car uh, of the early design. And basically, the British railroads are still that way. They have four, uh, just the four wheels. Well, well, on Americans, they have a double truck with with, uh, with eight wheels to the to the to the to each end. So it's much much different. And our cars, of course, could thus be much heavier on the line. Well, as all of this began, 
a whole whole profession emerged because now once the railroad came became into being uh, young young men particularly just th they thought this was the way to go this was a, an opportunity to do something that would uh, capture the public fancy and do, to be a railroad engineer what by the time we reach 1855 or 60 or beyond to be a railroad engineer was the, absolutely the crowning joy of a young boy and of course being a railroad conductor that wasn't bad either because technically the conductor was the was the uh, the, the leader of the train. The man who had the toughest job overall and when, uh, was the, the brakeman. He was the one who had to climb up on the top of the, uh, of the, car, of the cars and turn the wheel to, to put on the brakes when the train had to stop. Of course, this is before the, the development of the Westinghouse air brake sometime later. But this, the idea of being a member of a railroad crew, this was absolutely just so exciting. Uh, another thing, of course, that the, the in building the, the, the transit system, that, and this would apply any, almost anywhere in the United States at that time, you had to make arrangements for a place where uh, regularly the engine could stop and take on wood. And then you had to have another place where it could take on water because when the, you, bo you boil the water to create the steam, to create the steam that created the pressure and the, and the drive uh, mechanism for the train. And so basically, uh, every railroad, and this was certainly true of the ones that came to be in, Pens in the northwest Florida area, there were regular stops where you would take on fuel, and at about every hundred miles, they had to create a stop where there was a water tower, uh, where the uh, water supply could be continued. In fact, when we when went across, when the ultimate railroad was built across northwest Florida, a couple of the towns that are, were built then and are still there were built as wa primarily as water stops. There were no other reason for them to be there then, but that's what they did. Well, we, 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 our, our railroad, our first railroad, attempt in, 18, uh, in the 1830s failed. But by the time we get into the 1850s, everyone in the South realized that the, uh, the, so the South was never going to grow, never going to progress unless it had railroads. And so beginning in the early 1850s, a whole new series of agreements was reached, and the Pensacola became part of this. Our Colonel Chase, who are, who are the engineer who had built the uh, the uh, forts here at Pensacola became the president of a new company which was to build the Alabama and Florida Railroad. It was to originate at the docks in Pensacola with a station downtown and it would move north, almost directly north and was to, to uh, merge with a, another railroad being built across Alabama which had the, the, what was called the M&M, the Mobile and Montgomery and that was to, to originate in Mobile, move northeast uh, and of course or, uh, ultimately terminate uh, as far north as Richmond. Well, the, the the railroad, they began to do all the things that you would need for a railroad. They raised money by selling bonds. And by, the, or by 1855, 56, actual laying out of the, of the route was underway. Construction began. Colonel Chase was uh, working very rapidly. And he was working in conjunction with a man named Charles Pollard. Now, Mr. Pollard was the, was the, the guiding genius of the uh, Mobile and Montgomery Railroad. And the Pensacola, or the Alabama, Florida uh, segment of this was to end at a little village which was just being created, then was which was be called Pollard Junction, named for the railroad leader, and that went. This was about about three and a half to four miles east of our present day Flomaton, which of course is the the railroad junction today. Work went went forward. By the time we reached uh, 1858, the railroad was all about two thirds of the way complete, and the by this time the uh, city of Pensacola and its councilmen had invested uh, rather substantially in the bonds that were making this possible. Well, as all of this was happening, of course, uh, the war clouds were, were beginning to, to form, and people realized that once that railroad was completed, it made the perfect link between the the port of Pensacola and the railroad that could move north and south, or rather northeast and southwest across the south. So the, our harbor, our port, our uh, railroad, all were so impor important to the potential of a southern state that might p find itself at war. So by the time we reach the year 1860, the railroad is all but complete, and as they do, are doing their planning, and as people are even thinking about secession of states and the, a new Confederate States of America, the Alabama-Florida Railroad was so important, and it was in the news regularly on the national news media that we're publishing at that time. So that's where things stood with our railroading as the war clouds uh, darkened still further, and we were right on the verge of the war between the states. Thank you.